Mira played his card so well that during the time he was acting as the self-appointed spy of the governor, the latter had not the least inkling that on account of the doctor's little services for the emperor's companions, Omira was favorably regarded by Napoleon. He was a provider of news, and occasionally he brought the emperor papers and pamphlets. He knew his place, showed agreeable tact, and professionally suggested but never insisted upon the treatment he considered beneficial. As for Napoleon, whose health had only in very rare and quite casual instances required attention and who on that account had an overt disbelief in and a certain contempt for medicine, he made himself intolerable which was not altogether surprising. No one at Longwood knew that O'Meara's diligence was such that he carefully recorded all that the emperor said in his presence, firstly in making his report, and later in order to compile a journal from which he would reap the advantage. And Napoleon asserted that the surgeon was always there, only look after him and endeavor to comfort him. The sufferings he underwent most likely emanated from the development of a liver disease, probably hereditary, because his mother had left Corsica to take the waters at Bourbon and at irregular intervals had spent periods at Vichy the climate had conduced to make it worse as a tropical climate would have done the emperor was wholly unable to receive the only treatment which might have checked it namely that of mineral waters all the material conditions of his existence only caused its aggregation and the face of an utter ignorance of the law of hygiene those most rigidly enforced today. It is amazing how any one of the inhabitants of Longwood endured captivity in the absence of another doctor who might have been called in for an examination. The diagnosis of the emperor's disease rested with O'Meara. Its treatment was his business, and there was no one else to certify its nature or its gravity. This illness was irksome to low, and obstructed his regulations. O'Meara consequently became more and more repugnant to him. The strife increased, and the doctor seemed to take a delight in keeping the news from him. Besides, that sued the emperor, who, whether he was ill or not, and he was, had everything to gain by being afflicted with an illness caused by the climate, and which if it was not cured, would indicate a change of prison. Sooner or later, public opinion would be aroused, the bulletins of O'Meara would be given credence, and sympathy would inevitably go out to Napoleon, even if such had been his plan. Las Casas had not the distinction of being the first to broadcast these sensational complaints to Europe. They broke out before he left the Cape of Good Hope and immediately received all possible publicity, having had time to cover a lot of ground and to bring together those who were to judge them. We have seen that to reduce the cost of the Longwood household, Lord Bathurst requested the dismissal of four members. Captain Piankowski, whose departure no one regretted. Sintini, whose exact duties were very vague. Rousseau, who had charge of the silver, but who was of little use since the sale of part of the plate, a young Archambault undergroom. They left on October 28, 1816, but did not arrive at Portsmouth until February 25, 1817. Rousseau and Archibald left immediately for the United States, where they were to carry verbal messages to King Joseph Pinkowski, rejoin his wife in London, and with her devoted himself to lucrative swindling. Santini, who before leaving St. Helena had learned by heart the text of the Emperor's protest against the treaty of august 2nd decided with his corsican tenacity to give it all the publicity possible he was on his own he was poor he spoke no english but he struck lucky for one of his compatriots whom he met in a london street took him so we said to colonel wilson or to Macaroni asserted he confided in this Colonel, to whom he had been sent by the prisoners, and although it is not known for certain, it is very probable that Wilson played the chief part. He devoted himself to the publication of his pamphlet in English and French from Santini's dictation. Appeal to the English nation upon the treaty meted out to Napoleon Bonaparte on the island of St. Helena, which ran into seven editions in less than a fortnight. Finally, he introduced Santini to Lord Holland, who has denied having received his information about the prisoner from his servant and asserted that he obtained 
state it in another way, but he did not deny. Having seen Santini and certain facts that he produced could have been disclosed only by him when on March 18, 1817, he announced in the House of Lords that with the view to maintaining the good name of Parliament and the country from the disgrace which it would incur if Napoleon Bonaparte were treated in a severe and mean fashion, he proposed a conclusion to present an address to the Prince Regent to beg him to acquaint them with a copy of the instructions given to the governor respecting the personal treatment of Napoleon extracts from the governor's correspondence on the same manner and his dispatches relating to Bonaparte's request to send a letter to the Prince Regent to obtain the means of having religious instruction given to the children of the people who had accompanied him. These were surely reasonable requests, and Lord Holland, in opening his speech, had deliberately stated that he did not intend to broach the question of the lawfulness of the detention. He had not entered into details which might have moved a body of well-educated men, and yet, on almost every point, he drove Lord Bathurst back and forced him a string of audacious falsehoods. Lord Bathurst began by saying, the paper is signed by one Santini in which no credence can be placed. In thus treating a faithful servant, he completely forgot who had been his ancestors. But then he recovered his gravity. He disclosed to the noble lords the instructions Lowe had received, assumed complete responsibility for them, and declared, which was quite true, that the governor had assiduously observed them and that there was nothing wherewith to censure him regarding them. In the dispatches which Lowe had sent him, he found all the evidence he need call regarding secret correspondence and restrictions restriction of the limits within which Napoleon was permitted to walk and accompanied, a restriction which Lowe had considered unavoidable, since he had found that the general had abused the confidence reposed in him by conversing with the inhabitants. He cleverly imagined the eventuality of an escape in order to justify the precautions he had taken. He asserted that Longwood was the most pleasant and healthy spot of the whole island and that there had never been any question at the Congress of Vienna regarding Napoleon's deportation to St. Helena. He then entered into details of expense boasted of his generosity because the Council of Ministers had, upon Lowe's request, raised from £8,000 to £12,000 his contribution to an expense which could not have been less than £17,000 to £18,000. He did not say a word about the money demanded of the emperor, but he inspired fear when he spoke of the huge resources which Napoleon had at his disposal in Europe and concluded by a reference to the claims of the Frenchmen, the effect of which was irresistible. Immediately it was shown that the nine members of Bonaparte's suite consumed 266 bottles of various wines plus 42 bottles of porter each fortnight. In spite of the fact that Lord Holland did not reply and that after a short debate in which the Marquis of Buckingham and Lord Darnley supported the ministry, the motion was rejected without a division. Lord Bathurst triumphant before the Lords was not so. In public opinion, this pamphlet of Santini, despite its having been turned into ridicule, sold by the thousands in its natural realism, put it on a plane, and a very high one with it, with Warden's letters of the mysterious manuscript Venue de saint Hélène, which attracted universal attention and aroused wonderful enthusiasm. One had to wait for the emperor to reply to Lord Bathurst, he had no knowledge of his speech for three months, and then he spent until July, and his reply did not send it to Lowe, and the commissioners until October, and consequently did not reach Europe until the end of the year. The observations through the discourse to Lord Bathurst were printed only in English, and seemed to have remained unknown in France until 1821, and it was read Everything is lacking, St. Helena. Lord Bathurst's statements upon these matters are more than half of them untrue. The speaker takes a delight in publicly discussing matters which, by their very nature, are despicable and lend themselves to ridicule. And what contempt there is in the tone and the style 
of the Honorable Minister. It is the same in that part of his correspondence, which has been made public in 15 or 20 generations, reading the speeches and instructions of Lord Bathurst. His descendants will excuse themselves from being of the same blood as he who, by a mixture of savage hatred and ridiculous cowardice, has tarnished the moral character of the English people at a time when her victorious flags cover the world. There was no need for these harsh statements because public opinion had avenged itself of the embarrassing lies of the English minister, of his peremptory assertions, and of his compassion, which was the worst of his insults. I think I ought to add, wrote this man to Hudson Lowe a month after delivering his speech, that there is in this country no unwillingness to grant him decent meals or particular wine. That is sufficient. He offers wine to the emperor. The wine he prefers, so I have always heard say, is burgundy. All he will give Napoleon as much burgundy as he likes.